Don't laugh. One day last year, during Fast Kids, we were talking about a Bible story, and uh, John, Papa, Nicholas, and I were leading the discussion, and we have mostly non-church kids that come that don't have a lot of Christian background, so we make sure that we stick with a lot of the basic Bible stories that everybody should know, as well as some of the central teachings of the Bible that everybody needs to know. First and foremost is the gospel. And as we're just going over and explaining the gospel again, as we try to do often, it's the good old gospel message that Jesus died for our sins so that we might have unrestricted access to God and not have our sins as a barrier in our relationship with him. And so we can experience God's love and well, as if we accept him as our Lord and Savior that we spend eternity with him in heaven when we die. Very uh, essential and central to the Christian faith. But then as we're, as we're teaching and talking about that, uh, a hand goes up and it's like, you said we go to heaven when we die. What do you mean we're going to die? And I said, uh, yes, well, of course, everybody dies. What do you mean we all die? And a couple, and one kid was asking the questions like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm going to die someday? Yeah. And then a few other kids were going like, I'm going to die one day? Yes, you too. We're all going, we're all going to die one day. And then they were, they were a little bit worked up about that. And then um, my thinking was, is this seriously the first time that this, is this seriously the first time this occurred to you? Well, yeah. And then thought, well, that was a little awkward to uh, have have the news broken to a few of them all of a sudden. It seemed like more of them than not already understood that, but about three of them that were a little bit bothered by that. So I went home later in the day. Um, Mary, my wife, teaches lifespan development classes at university, so um, often teaching on different developmental milestones. So I tell her what happened, and then I say to kids, how old are kids before they realize that they're, that everybody dies one day? And she said, well, it tends to be a little bit older, so um, good job breaking it to them. Now, a lot of unchurched kids in the neighborhood, we're, we'll see if they're going to come back or not. And so I'm going like, oh, no. I um, Somehow that felt like things got bungled. But the, the following week, the following week they came back. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that kids don't know, but... You know, I'd, I'd rather their parents break it to them. But foundational to that, and it's it's a real problem that we all deal with in this life, and that a lot of us just try to avoid most of the time the unpleasant reality of death. That we're all we're all going to die. In the Bible, everybody dies except for a few people. They say, we have in the book of Genesis, said that Enoch walked with God and was very close to him. He was one of the patriarchs um, before Noah, so between Adam and Noah, so very, very old. It said that he walked with God and was close to God. It doesn't tell us very much about him, but it says that the Lord took him. So he didn't die. And then we have later in the Old Testament that Elijah is taken up to heaven in, the, in a chariot of fire. But everybody else, everybody else faces death. And that's a real problem that all religions deal with. Death, the fact that, the fact that we all need to face it and make peace with it. it. A lot of the time, knowing that it's coming one day really changes how we live. And a lot of the time, it's when people get very close to the very end where they realize it's inevitable. Like, it's going to happen within the week, is a lot of people that have had hard hearts their whole life 
really start to think about, okay, what my days are numbered, what comes next? And you see a lot of people accept Christ at the last minute when their hearts are softened because they're bothered by the question, the, the questions, the existential questions that they've put off for their whole life. Now, we're looking at, we've been going through the book of Luke. In the last few weeks in the preceding passage, we have Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and he falls asleep when a big storm blows in. The boat starts filling with water and starts to sink, and the disciples, handful of them being seasoned fishermen that have been out on the water their whole lives, familiar with those waters, familiar with that place, the boat's starting to sink and they're panicking. And they wake Jesus up saying, don't you care that we're all going to die? And with the word, he calms the storm. He rebukes the storm, it says, and the storm stops. And the water turns back to glassy clear. And the disciples are afraid, saying, who is this in the boat with us? And then you have them get to the other side of the lake and then heal a demon. Jesus heals a demon-possessed man that's out of his mind, casting a legion of demons out of him and setting the man free, putting him back into his right mind. So we have the points of those passages from Luke's perspective. We have Jesus as Jesus is Lord over nature, having power over it, Lord of the universe. And then we see Jesus casting out a demon, being Lord and supreme over the spiritual realm. And then here, Jesus reveals that he has power over sickness, and power over death itself. Let's read the passage, Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, returned from where? He's on his way back to the other side again of the Sea of Galilee. He left the crowd there, and then when they come back, it seems that a crowd's still waiting for him. A crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. And then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. So we have Jairus, sometimes translated a ruler of the synagogue, was there, comes, comes to Jesus. Now it's a little, can be a little bit confusing when we're reading the New Testament. You don't. Know, you don't see much of the synagogues in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, you have the temple in Jerusalem where they have three festivals a year that able-bodied people are expected to go to if they can. But other than that, week in and week out on the Sabbath, people went to the synagogue, which was um, every town of any size had a synagogue or a few synagogues being a local place of worship where people would gather to worship and hear the reading of the law or reading of the Old Testament. And the synagogues as well had schools for children up, up to about um, the age of, well, and our equivalent would be about sixth grade, where people would go to learn about the faith and be discipled. So the uh, main person at a synagogue was the ruler of the synagogue. Um, with the temple being destroyed in 70 AD, years after Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, um, the temple's no more. The temple hasn't existed for nearly 2,000 years. The Jews no longer make sacrifices. So what Judaism has become is synagogue Judaism or rabbinic Judaism. So now we call the head of the synagogue or the ruler of the synagogue a rabbi, as, as they did then. But what we have now is rabbinic Judaism with no more priests, no more temple, and no more sacrifices. So in this day, they come back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Everybody's waiting for them. Jarius, synagogue leader, comes and falls at Jesus' feet. 
pleading with him to come quickly because it stresses the direness of the situation. His only daughter, his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, a woman was there that was subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. And if you're following along in the text, there's a footnote there, as some versions add, some of the earliest versions add, and some do not, saying that she had spent all that she had on medical care, looking for a cure, but nobody could help her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Your cloak is basically your long jacket, kind of like a trench coat or outer garment. So she touches the edge of Jesus' cloak, and immediately she's healed. Her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked, as it seems that she snuck up behind him to get healed. And the power that was in Jesus healed her. I almost have this picture of it like a defibrillator being charged or a jump starter, and she comes and takes it from Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus knows. I believe Jesus knew. Jesus knew who touched her, but it seemed that he wanted to see her. When they all denied it, Pe Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. So Peter's saying, how do we know we're, we're in such a crowd here? We've all been in a crowd like that where everybody's touching you and bumping you and brushing up against you. So how do you know, how do you know who did it? Well, we see, we see that in the Bible sometimes that we see that with Jesus, and we see that with the apostles, and we see that with, with Peter and Paul, that people are touching their garments to get healed. It's saying their shadows, even their shadows touched people as they walked by in the book of Acts, and they were healed. But they were sending out cloths and aprons that had touched them to other people who, had, who were then healed. One time I got a curious piece of mail from a ministry organization that I wasn't familiar with. And it had, it had in there with the letter, it had a folded up piece of paper with the design on it that made it look like a fake paper blanket. And the letter said, this is a prayer cloth like in the book of Acts. So this is your prayer cloth, so mail it back to us. We'll pray over it and then we'll mail it back to you so you could be healed. But then it said healings require faith. And so you have to have faith for this to work, because if you don't have faith, it won't work. And yes, I agree with all that. But then it said in order to demonstrate your faith, you need to send it back with money. A meaningful amount of money. An amount of money that demonstrates how much faith you have. Because according to how much faith you have, which then dictates how much money you send in with it, then that'll dictate how much healing power is on it when this paper blanket or paper prayer cloth is mailed back to you. And they're half right, and that's how it works, but uh, something, something seemed a little bit unsettling about that with the prayer cloth with the prayer cloth there requiring money because, well, I've read the book of Acts. I've read these passages with the garments and the prayer cloth. And none of them require to donate a sizable donation to activate them. So it seemed, seemed a little scammy to me, but demonstrates, demonstrates well how the principle works minus the money part. So... 
This woman touched Jesus. Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched them, touched him, and how she had instantly been healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So she was trembling, falling at his feet, thinking that she was going to get in trouble. But Jesus tells her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, somebody came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. So here they all know that Jesus had a healing gift as he had healed other people prior to this account. So they knew that Jesus had the power to heal, but they thought that, well, if he would have been there 20 minutes ago, he could have healed her, but now that she's dead, it must be too late. That seems like a logical, seems like a logical um, conclusion there. So they're saying, don't, don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus doesn't need to come anymore because it's too late. She's dead. Luke, slowly as you read the Gospel of Luke, and it's the same way with the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, they reveal slowly who Jesus is and his miracles and what he does revealing who he is being the Son of God. Because once he reveals that, once it's revealed that he's the divine Son of God, the Messiah, first the Messiah, then the divine Son of God, once that's understood, once it's all out in the open, the temple leaders, the Sanhedrin, decides that they need to do something about this. And that's where they end up having him arrested, put on trial, given false testimony from false witnesses, and ultimately crucified. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke start revealing who Jesus is slowly, the way that Jesus himself did it. That's, that's an inductive pattern of reasoning, kind of letting the events unfold as you start drawing your own conclusions, slowly revealing who Jesus is to the reader. And that, that's the aim of the Gospels, sharing the good news of Jesus and letting it unfold. John's Gospel, on the other hand, just starts off with who Jesus is. You open it, it's like the beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it starts off saying that Jesus was God, God in the flesh. Then you go down a few verses to 14, it says, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt here among us. And it starts teaching about Jesus. Then it's showing the miracles and the teachings in order to back up those claims rather than unfolding them and getting to the end. So we have the deductive structure in John saying who Jesus is and giving the evidence to support it versus Luke here slowly unfolding Jesus, who Jesus is. And then as we get further and further in, we start to realize it where at the beginning of the story, the disciples don't even quite get it yet. And so, by the time we get to the end of Luke's Gospel, we see who Jesus is. And that it requires a choice whether we're going to put our faith and believe in him or not, or reject him as the Sanhedrin did. So here we have Jarius. Some people come from his house, don't bother the teacher anymore because she's dead. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house of Jairus, 
He did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. So that's the inner circle of Jesus. You have 70 disciples that follow him. You have the 12 apostles. And then you have Peter, James, and John that seem to be especially close to Jesus. So you have Peter, James, John, Jesus, the child's mother and father go in. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. They, it seemed that they had already checked things out and gone through the procedure to see was she in fact dead or just unconscious? And they were pretty, sh pretty darn sure that she was dead. I took an EMT class in college and it was clear, you know, they, you got to, you got to make sure somebody's dead before you call them dead. Um, in fact, then if we decided to go work in an ambulance, there were only a few conditions in which we were allowed to pronounce somebody dead. The conditions were, um, it had to be real obvious or else you needed a coroner uh, who was a medical doctor to be able to make quite sure of it. They said, you know, don't just don't call somebody dead unless a few conditions are met. And I remember them, if, if their head's removed from their body, they're dead. If they're badly incinerated, you know, charred to death, they're dead. If they have rigor mortis, they're dead. If, they're be if you find a body that's badly decomposed, they're dead. Otherwise, let the doctor do that. But here they're pretty sure not, not breathing, no pulse, so they laughed at Jesus knowing that she's dead. I mean, this is if in their mind, God can heal, but can God do anything about death? They're wondering, they, can Jesus do anything about death? They're thinking like, if you tell people to have faith and you go in there and they're dead and you can't do anything about it, that's kind of embarrassing and probably traumatic for the mother and father. It says, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned. Key key part of that passage, her spirit returned. It wouldn't say her spirit returned unless her spirit was gone. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Interesting, in the passage before He's over across the Sea of Galilee in the Gentile realm. He heals the demon-possessed man. The demon-possessed man says, I want to follow you. I want to come with you. But he says, no, stay here and tell others about me. But then here, Jesus says, don't tell anyone what had happened. Why? Well, he was back in the land of Israel where he's still keeping things under wrap with who he is. And he's fine with people telling about he can cast out demons, he can heal, he has power over nature, but being able to bring the dead back to life, something only God can do. And so he hadn't yet, as I was talking about the inductive structure of slowly revealing who he is, because once that's out of the bag, he's arrested and he's crucified. So they're still keeping it under wraps here. Don't tell anybody what has happened, but it says everybody darn well knew what was happened as everybody's wailing outside and sure she's dead. Now, they can't hide her forever. She's there. She was dead. And now she's alive. The main 
the main purpose of this passage that Luke wants us to know and that Jesus himself was revealing was Jesus' power over death. So we have being revealed, Jesus has power over the physical realm with him calming the storm. Jesus has power over demons in the spiritual realm with him casting out demons. And then here, Jesus has power over sickness and health. We already knew that in Luke's gospel. But then here, Jesus has power over death. And in doing Bible interpretation, you have to start when you read a passage and say, what, what did the original author mean for the original reader to know? What idea was he trying to get across? You really have to start with that with the Bible, because if you're going to make it something completely different now that it could have never meant then, then that's what we call misinterpreting the Bible. It's really easy to do but we if we start what did the original author mean for the original reader to know and then once we understand that we can start getting to what does the why did god cause this to be put in the bible what does he want us to know now so we have to understood what was meant then before we could begin to unpack what does it mean now what does it mean for my life? What does it mean for the believer? What does this mean for the church? And in that, we have to read it in context. We have to read each verse in context of the paragraph that's around it, in context of the chapter that it's in in the Bible, in context of the book it's in. So here we're looking at this in the context of Luke chapter 8, as well as the surrounding chapters. And we see, leading up to it, Jesus' power over nature, Jesus' power over demons, Jesus' power over sickness, Jesus' power over death, all building up this picture that he's the divine Son of God. And then lining it up, does this interpretation agree with all of Scripture? Because if we're getting something completely different here than what the rest of Scripture teaches, we can deduce that we're getting it wrong. If it's way outside the rest of biblical revelation. And then when you have narratives, which are the stories of the Bible, are the stories of the Bible, you have to ask yourself, are they prescriptive or descriptive? Prescriptive meaning... Are they telling what happened and we're supposed to copy it in some way? Or is it just describing what happened because it's supposed to teach us something about God and life? And in here as we ask these questions, we see this is teaching us about Jesus being Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, Lord of the spiritual realm, Lord of death. And we see with Jesus and his interaction, First, we see him healing this lady that has a bleeding problem. Almost by accident, it seems, as she sneaks up behind him and touches him to be healed. And it's, what does it say her reaction was? We, we see that she falls down at the feet of Jesus. Another theme in this passage, a man named Jarius, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. So we see this woman falling at Jesus' feet. We see the ruler of the synagogue falling at Jesus' feet. What do we see here? We see healing, grace, and mercy are found by humbly coming to the feet of Jesus. It takes a lot of humility to fall down at somebody's feet. When was the last time you fell down at somebody's feet? begging them for something. I mean, can, can you think of it? I mean, who, who do we do that for? I mean, would you do that if you met Queen Elizabeth? <laughs> no, I'm an American, of course not. <laughs> I'm not a subject, right? I mean, we, we, don't, we don't usually fall down at somebody's feet. 
Maybe if you're begging forgiveness. Maybe if you're begging your husband or wife not to leave. Otherwise, it's not something we do. Yet, Jesus is worthy of falling at his feet. And here, both of these people, I mean, here we have a man of status. A rabbi, a ruler of the synagogue, coming and falling at the feet of Jesus. It's something we all need. It's something I need. It's something you need to come to the feet of Jesus. We have man of status falling at Jesus' feet, woman falling at Jesus' feet after she'd spent all she had and was desperate. Often, as I was talking about, desperate times bring us to the feet of Jesus. As I said before, it's often times when people are going through crisis where they first come to the feet of Jesus, when they first realize, I'm powerless over what's going on here. It's often health problems that first bring people to the feet of Jesus, being in the hospital, losing a loved one, having things just get out of control, addiction, often bring us to the feet of Jesus. And we have to come there humbly. As I was talking about Bible interpretation, it seems that we, we have the Word of God here. And it seems a bit arrogant to me to think that we could all understand it all perfectly. I don't. You see some Bible study teachers, elders in churches, pastors especially, think they know it all. But one thing that seminary taught me, especially, is that I don't know everything. It's humbling to think, yeah, I know all about this passage. And you write a paper, and you turn it in, and you have an experienced New Testament or Old Testament scholar pick it apart and give it back to you. And you quickly realize I don't, I don't have it all figured out as well as I thought I had it all figured out. You see, uh, I'm not a world-class biblical scholar. Very few pastors are. They're rare. Yet, we have, to, we have to approach the text with humility that this is the Word of God, and the Bible tells us that now we see like through a fog glass. But one day... Not today, not tomorrow, but on the other side of glory, we're going to see it all clearly and have a much more perfect understanding than we do now. So in the meantime, I mean, God has a lot of mystery to him. I'm still learning. We're all still learning, figuring more and more of it out of having a perfect book, but lacking perfect interpreters to it. We have to learn exegetical humility. And like these people coming before the feet of Jesus, we have to spend time at the feet of Jesus, humbly before him to be able to understand it and to be able to get a touch from God. Jesus, Jesus had a lot of run-ins with other religious people. He especially had problems with the Pharisees who thought they knew everything. There's a lot of Pharisees out there still today who think they know everything. Hmm. And then we see another thing here. This woman touched Jesus and was healed. Then we see Jesus came. What does it say? Verse 54. He went in. He took the girl by the hand, saying, My child, get up. Two things. Touch, he touched them both. Both were touched by him. Touching Jesus brings healing physically, emotionally, spiritually, touching every aspect of our life. Here in these passages, we see a touch from Jesus, a word from Jesus, calms the storm, casts out demons, frees people from sickness, raises the dead. <laughs> Once Jesus touches you, you're never the same. But... A lot of people don't want to be touched by Jesus. Remember, remember the last passage where he went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, cast out demons, scared people, and they said, we don't want you here. You're scaring us. You, 
you caused the pigs to drown, please leave us. And Jesus leaves. He doesn't force himself on anybody. And yet, those who come to him for a touch, their lives are changed. They're healed. And we see here, as you're stu if you're studying the Gospels, there's a few categories of miracles, if you're going to categorize them. Um, first category of the miracles we see Jesus do is this phys uh, physical healing. We see Jesus heal people. We see Jesus heal an awful lot of people. So first category is physical healing. Second category is casting out demons. We see in the next passage that we're going to get into next week that Jesus gives these powers to the apostles and sends them out two by two on a mission. So power to heal, power to cast out demons, power over nature, calming the wind, calming the storm, and then the power over death. So we see, we see these four different types of miracles here. And then we see with these miracles, verse 48, the woman who was healed of her bleeding, Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. So we see miracles require faith. Kind of like the prayer cloth, except you don't need to, you don't need to pay for it because it's free. So, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And what does Jesus say to Dar Dar Jarius when they say, your daughter is dead? Verse 49, your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. But hearing this, Jesus said to Jarius, don't be afraid. Just believe. Believe means to have faith. Just believe and she will be healed. So miracles re require faith. Even the miracle of resurrection and heaven requires faith. Your faith has healed you, and don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Remember in the Gospels, if you've read through them, Jesus goes back to his hometown. He's been outside his hometown healing people and doing miracles. And then he goes back to his hometown he teaches in the synagogue, but then it says he could do no miracles there because of their lack of faith. Really interesting to think about that as faith plays a role in our healing and in, in our miracles even today. And they're not always so automatic. They take time, but the Bible tells us don't give up hope. If you're praying for a miracle, ask, seek, knock. Keep asking. If you've been a believer for a while and been part of a church, you hear this in every church. Somebody's praying for something. And maybe they're praying for it for a year. How many times have I heard the story of, man, I prayed for that for 40 years. Never giving up. And then it finally happened. Anybody here heard that before? I heard that one before? Yeah, I've... I think I've heard that in every church I've ever been a part of. Don't give up. But here, the real thrust of this passage, the real point, Jesus conquers death. And we see that a few times throughout the gospel. And finally, Jesus conquering death once and for all with himself being raised from the dead after his death on the cross. Now, in the Bible, the Bible starts out in the, in the Garden of Eden where Jesus creates people that are designed to live forever. Yet, it's when they disobey God that death is brought into the world. So, death isn't what God intended for us. Yet, it's mercy that we don't have to live forever in a sinful state. That once we're resurrected and on the other side of this life, we're no longer in a sinful state. We're no longer sinful people. We no longer have this body that's aging. 
and decaying. We have perfect health. No more aches and pains. What does the Bible tell us in the book of Revelation? That once we get to the end of the Bible, we see no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears, for Jesus himself wipes away every tear from our eyes. Now, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more aches and pains. I mean, looking around, most of us have had some aches and pains by the time you've gotten out of bed and had breakfast this morning. Yet, death comes because that's not our final state. We see here, it's the first time in the gospel here that Jesus, Jesus con conquers death. It's something we all face. It's something a lot of people want to ignore. But we can't, ig we can't ignore it. I mean, certainly we can't ignore it once we're past the age of 10. We all know this uncomfortable truth. And with death, there's only a few logical options of what can happen. You die and what happens? Well, option one is you're dead. If this life is all you have, once you're dead, that's it. You don't exist anymore. Like you didn't exist before you were born, you don't exist. If this life is all you have, you live this life, and you're gone. And if that's the case, does anything we do even matter? If it's all just a big accident, if you live, you die, all you are is a bunch of cells and molecules that are stuck together as an, as an evolutionary accident. If you live and you die and then you're gone, if nothing matters, if we're all just a biological accident, then nothing really matters and there's nothing we could really do about it. So why do anything at all? I mean, it, that thinking just to lead you down, can lead you down a dark, meaningless, purposeless path with no hope. But a lot of people believe that. Uh, you live, you die, you're gone, and that's it. It's really sad. Death, then, is really, really sad. Or option two, other religions answer it with you're reincarnated. You come back, your energy comes back as something else. Reincarnation is usually not a nice thing. It's like you just come back over and over and over as, you know, a worm, a plant, a goat, and you do this forever. Not a, lot, not a lot of hope in that. Or there's an afterlife. You, you come back. And Jesus taught, we do come back. Even, even in the Old Testament, we don't see a really well-developed notion of the afterlife. We, we see in the Gospels that the Pharisees believed there was an afterlife. Those are mostly the synagogue people. And the temple people, being the priests, the Sadducees, didn't believe there was an afterlife. They believed that mm, you die and that's it. And I didn't get this a long time ago. Years ago, I remember being in an undergraduate college class in philosophy of religion and professors carrying on about, like, well, in the Old Testament, you don't really see much about the afterlife that's really undeveloped. They didn't know where they were going when they died. And my hand goes up. And then I said, no, you, you really do see the afterlife. What about when the patriarchs die? We see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dies. And it says they lived to a good old age. They died and then they were gathered to their people, being reunited with their ancestors. And he says, maybe, or it could mean that they were added to the family bone pile buried there. And I'm saying like, no, that's just not right. And he's saying, no, it's right. Look it up. And I see, no, okay. He's, he, he, he may be right there or else you wouldn't have had the Pharisees and the Sadducees arguing about that, arguing about whether or not there's an afterlife. You see in the Psalms, the concept of Sheol and you see in the New Testament, Sheol and Hades is used interchangeably. 
it was sort of a place of the dead and very very vague not not so much of of we know as the new testament teaches of heaven and hell of where we spend eternity yet with all this we're talking about luke showing us jesus having the power over death and then working it up to the grand ending of jesus's death on the cross and glorious resurrection it's something for the believer that's good to be reminded of that believer or non-believer we're not children anymore we know that we're all going to die and given that most people are in denial about it if we really realize that we'd probably be a whole lot nicer to each other and cooperate better but for the believer first corinthians chapter 15 the whole chapter lays it out really well but i'll i'll end with it as a good reminder but first corinthians 15 20 but in fact christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep first fruit being jesus has risen first and all of us who put our faith in him are going to be raised from the dead after him for as man came by death a man has also come to the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die meaning the first sin brought death into the world so also in christ also in christ shall all be made alive we will live again because jesus has power over death 23 but in his own order christ the first fruit then at his coming those who belong to Christ so all who belong to Christ will be resurrected you have to belong to him to be resurrected verse 24 then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying the very rule of every authority and power for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet the last enemy to be destroyed is death for God has put all things in subjugation under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjugation, it is plain that he is ex expected who put all things in subjugation under him. When all things are subjugated to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjected under him, that God may be in all. So first time in the gospel here revealed Jesus has conquered death once and for all is what the gospel teaches but in Luke it began that's first shown or demonstrated by Jesus raising this little girl back to life just as each one of us will be raised from the dead and this shapes our whole worldview as Christians and gives us a wonderful hope Amen. Now, let's sing our last song. And as we do, I just want to invite anybody to come forward who needs prayer. Or as it says, or as it says here, all who belong to Christ. If you don't belong to Christ and you want to make sure you do, I want to invite you to come forward so I can pray with you. Or if you want prayer for anything else, I'm here and happy to pray with you during the last song. So come on forward. <laughs>